Hi, and welcome to The Curling Show, the podcast that brings you interviews with the sports top athletes and the people who shape the game. Supported by listeners who have made secure donations at thecurlingshow.com. I'm Dean Gemmel, and this edition is part two of a conversation with Dan Raphael, the Canadian who coaches Team China. You know, you talked a little bit about the, uh, the language barrier you have with the men's team versus the women's team, but what's a, uh, what's a practice like with Team China? A practice? Wow. Well, they certainly understand curling terms. So, you know, that, for that part, it's, it's not so difficult. Uh, we train, uh, are you asking about the training? Or yeah, I mean, just how does a practice unfold for you? As much as you can, as much as you're willing to share, uh, you know, well, what, what sort of, I mean, well, you're on, we, and I, my understanding is, that, you know, your teams are on the ice quite a bit throwing rocks. Yeah, well, what we do, uh, actually what I've been trying to do this past season is to uh, fix a lot of the problems that, uh, you know, because they're so new to curling, they still have a lot of ideas that, to me, are, are foreign. I'll give you a good example, not to, you know, get away from the question, but uh, a good example is the, the men's coach uh, this summer. At one point, I went out onto the ice, and I looked, and I saw three of the girls throwing takeouts on one sheet, and one girl, you know, the lead, throwing draws and taps on the other sheet. And I said, well, what are you doing? And he goes, well, Jenny, Jenny being the lead, she, he says, uh, she doesn't uh, throw takeout, she plays lead. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, you know, as far as I know, everybody should be able to throw every shot in the book, whether you're lead, second, or third. And uh, sure enough, uh, halfway through the season, we, we ended up in Brantford, and uh, two of the uh, five girls were sick, and Jenny had to play second, and all of a sudden she's throwing takeout. So, you know, I looked at the coach and I said, Okay, so she doesn't throw takeouts. Now we're in trouble, right? Right. But uh, we're able to get by. But uh, it's just little things like that. I I let the uh, the coaches run their practices. We, we schedule certain things uh, that we want to do, and I just basically supervise a lot. Now, is is this basically your full time job now? It is. Uh, since last June, uh, well, not counting the last week I've been here. But since last June, which made 10 months, I was home a grand total of 11 days. Had you been to China at all before you took this job on? Never. And thoughts on that country? Of, pardon? And thoughts on that country? Oh, it's a great country. I, I love it. I mean, the people there are great. Uh, sure enough, I haven't been everywhere in China, but uh, the places I've been to, they're, the people are fabulous. They're friendly. Uh, most of them don't understand what you're saying anyway, but uh, I, I just like the culture. It's, uh, there's a lot of things that take getting used to, but you know, every time you do something in China as a Canadian or as a foreigner for that fact, you just have to stop and think three billion people, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, like, you know, when I first thought, uh, started to see how they drove, you know, how they drove their cars and, you know, their roads, rules, so to speak. Uh, the way, yeah. The way it works in China is the car comes first, bicycle second, person is last, as opposed to Canada where person is first and car is last. Except in Montreal, Dan. Except in Montreal, yeah, but we won't go there. Yeah. I live there, I know. Yeah. So in China, you know, I asked them, I said, well, why do you guys think that way? And they said, well, with the amount of people we have in our country, if you were, if the car was to stop for every person that crossed the road, car would never move and i said well you have a point yeah i mean i guess so, they know better about having three billion people in the country than we do right exactly exactly hey well you know it's, it sounds like it's been you know it's a fairly fascinating experience uh i think um you know i i i understand uh i think i understand the anxiety that it creates for canadians i don't i don't think it's right but i understand the anxiety uh, oh i i don't blame i don't blame the players at all whether they're from canada or from U.S. or from wherever, it, it, you know, when you grow up, uh, you know, starting curling at uh, eight years old like I have, and, you know, you every day you go to work and the only practice you get in is maybe a couple hours at night when you can get ice, and then you have to get in a car and pay your gas and your hotel and go to a tournament on the weekend, 
absolutely I understand all these players. But uh, actually, the, the funny thing is I talked to my, uh, my boss yesterday, and I said, so how are the players? And he goes, well, I gave them a month off, and I, I almost fell off my chair. Because as you well know, the Chinese are pretty well 24-7. I mean, they, they're going all the time. And uh, when I tried to get two days off for them last year, it was like pulling teeth. So now the fact that they got a month off, wow. it was, uh, yeah, I was quite shocked. And, uh, they're not yeah, in Vegas, least, are they? What's that? They're not in Vegas or anything, are they? Oh, yeah. God, no. They're, they're going home. They, they don't get to go home a lot. So That's what I understand. I mean, they're really, uh, you know, they're at the beck and call of the Sports Federation or whatever it's called. Well, the way I look at it, I mean, I don't know if that's their culture or whatever, but the way I look at it is if you're not going to be a curler, what are you going to do? You know, and that's one of the reasons uh, I think the boss jokingly said I was going to give them two months off and tell them to find a job. Yeah. Just so they know what it's like to go and work. Well, they could assemble DVD players. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but, I'm sure, uh, you know, yeah, it, might, it probably is a, a pretty great job, except for the, the time, I guess, right? Yeah. I mean, and and the, other, the other thing, you know, along that track is... Uh, the World University Games, a lot of people question me as to the fact that how can they be students if they're always on the road? And I told them, I said, look, I, I was prepared for those questions only because I, I asked my boss, I said, you know, I'm going to get asked this question, so what do I answer? And I never really got any information other than I, I did get all the uh, the rules and regulations of the World University Games. And once you read them, technically, these, these guys are students. They're registered at a, at a place of education. They're a part of a sports school. I mean, we think of school and university as, you know, going to school every day with your books and you're learning math and you're learning physics and whatever it is. But these are sports students and they're learning curling. They actually have to put in reports after t every tournament, after every practice. They have to tell them what they learned, uh, you know, those types of things. So it's a little bit more foreign than what we're used to. But uh, well, I would have to say, Dan, I, I consider that a bit of a stretch. <laughs> well, it's, it's a little bit of a stretch, but hey, I mean, that's the way they think. So You know, you know we may see a team from the uh, University of Phoenix taking online courses. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I don't know. That's uh, that does seem I mean, a bit of a read, stretch to if, me, but it sounds like it wasn't really your call, anyway. So no, it wasn't my call. But uh, like I said, the only let's put it this way: the the next World University Games will probably be the same theme again. The only restriction that we can't bypass is the uh, the age restriction. So what is, what is yeah, the age restriction for the World University Games? It's Twenty seven and under. Oh, so, just don't. So grand, the one I call grandma, which is the third. Uh, she's uh, she's off the team next time. All and, right. Uh, she was 27 this year. All right, Dan. Hey, you know, I appreciate your time. This was insightful, and I think, uh, you know, there's always been a lot of questions about, about what goes on with this team and with your coaching role, so it's, it's been good to, to talk to you this directly and have, have you know, more than just sound bites here. Uh, hey, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure there's a lot more questions that are going to come up, but, uh, hey, maybe you can have me on again. I, I'd be happy to have you back and on. I'd Let's be, finish uh, with the run back, though. Okay. Give you a topic, give me your thoughts in one to three words. Uh, the silver by Team Hungry at the World Mixed Doubles. Uh, Canadian coach. The steamy temperatures inside the arena during the early rounds in Moncton. Oh, <laughs> actually, I... I from what I heard, uh, they spent, I think it was seventy seventy four thousand dollars for dehumidifier. Uh, that wasn't worked. seventy four grand well spent, I don't think. No, well, it worked eventually, but I just don't think. I mean, Hans did a great job eventually, but uh, he just got caught with his pants down, I guess. That's unfortunate for Hans. Yeah, unfortunate <laughs> for all of us. <laughs> yeah, it looked. Uh... I mean, the first practice, uh, the the official came out and. He said, oh, by the way, uh, if you go out and you throw a rock and you feel that you cannot continue to practice, you're free to leave. And I went, okay. So basically what I did is I had the player throw the stone. I took a hairbrush and I just snow plowed and I literally snow plowed all the way down and just shoveled all the snow out of the way. 
we we did about five minutes and just laid back after that. Who knew hot yoga would be good training for curling? Um, the experience of curling in Korea. Curling in Korea? Oh, you're talking about the women's world? Yeah, the women's side. Oh, God. That was fantastic. Uh, it, it basically proving that uh, Vernon wasn't a fluke. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody did think it was a fluke, to be honest. Especially on the women's side. I mean, you know, the men, you know, also won a, a sort of lesser uh, Ashton World Curling Tour event this year. But uh, mm-hmm. the men certainly, I don't think, are, are at the same level as the women. But the women, I mean, last year in Vernon, I, you know, I thought, you know, uh, Jennifer Jones misses a couple shots and you win there. So, uh, you know, I, I wasn't surprised at all. Um, Renee Simons, uh, out of a job with Team Kelly Scott. Oh, God, that's the first I hear of that. No, I didn't hear that, yeah. No. Cut. Uh, wow. <laughs> you know, that's... that's I'm, uh, I'm surprised. Yeah. I mean, they're going uh, to shuffle the lineup, and, you know, they could pick a lead from anywhere at this point, I guess. Yeah, well, I, it's like anybody else. I mean, Jennifer Jones cut her lead, I believe, and picked up Dawn, and yep. everybody was up in arms, and look at her now, so... I'll tell you what, yeah. leads are it's tenuous, man. Holy smokes. I know. Um... How about Team Abdelil? Team Abdelil. Um, wow, my old team. Thanks, Dean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'd have to say that bodies they have now are good enough to win. They just have to get their heads on straight. There you go. Good, good honest answer. Uh, Eve Muirhead being selected to skip Great Britain at the 2010 Games. Uh, good choice. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that is a good choice. She did seem, uh, I think Al Cameron in his blog in the Calgary Herald said it best of the world where I think she got a little more input than she needed from her teammates. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's uh, with a bit of confidence. I mean, I, I, actually, I, I interviewed Greg Stremlaw, and, um, you know, one of the things we talked about was juniors being eligible to play down for, for the Scotties and the Briar. I think, I think it's time to make it happen. I look at Rachel Holman's team, for example, in the pre-trials, and I think... Uh, you know, they're just one of the top teams in Canada. Oh, Rachel's a fabulous team. Uh, it's just for a while there, she because uh, we ran into her two years running in uh, in London, and again this year with the Chinese team, and <laughs> we just can't be, seem to beat her in the final of London. But uh, I think she was just uh, for about two or three years running there. Uh, she was running into a roadblock with uh, her provincial playdown in right. Ontario. But, uh, and at Rachel the same Holman, time, when she was losing those provincial junior finals, I, I thought she could win the women's side. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So. And great coach, too. Oh, Earl yeah, Morris. sure. Earl, Earl Morris coaching them. And, uh, yeah. Hey, what do you think about Earl? Uh, in the, did you watch the Canadian junior women's final? Uh, I did not, unfortunately. Oh, so you didn't see uh, when she played like a tough double for two in the eighth? Oh, I, I read and I seen it, but uh, yeah, wow. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, what, what's your take on that? Some people thought Earl maybe should have been more forceful and told her, you know, what shot to play. I kind of like, to be honest, that he didn't because they are juniors. Uh, well, it's all about the relationship between the coach and the, uh, the players. You know, it's always nice to say, well, you should be forceful because they're juniors. But, you know, if you as a coach say to yourself, well, if I blow up here and I tell her that's what she's playing, well, she's probably not going to make the shot anyway. So. Yeah, I, I just think uh, when you're talking about a, a young player, I mean, the, the she got the best lesson she could have out of that, I think. Uh, I think she'll remember it for a while. Yeah. So, and, and, and to be honest, I think that's the role of a, of a coach at that stage more than anything. But that's yeah, my it's, opinion. Um, it's, uh, it's the same with the... Uh, the tenth end in the, the men's world this year, but uh, yeah, we could go on and on about that one. Yeah, we sure could. Uh, I mean, Jules didn't didn't. I mean, Jules rarely comes out in timeouts. It was odd that he even came out, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. You know, and same with Glenn Howard. I mean, you know, they don't have coaches come out. Now, when you come out, it's generally if you can explain it well enough on your magnetic board, you usually get the shot called that you suggest, right? Well, actually, the story, uh, I'll clarify that story, too. The, the story behind the magnetic board, again, is the, uh, the language barrier. I normally go out with a translator, and uh, this past season in uh, New Zealand at the Pacific Curling Championships, I went out, and uh, one of the shots was to come up and 
uh, tap a rock into the top eight. And anyway, the the translator went on, and the uh, the timeout was over, and off we walked the sheet. The translator looks at me uh, when we got back to the table, and he says, "What's top eight? And I went, "You're kidding me, right?" <laughs> So from that point on, I just bring out the board, and it's just, it's a lot quicker for them to see than it is just to, and a lot of times you'll see a coach out on the timeout pointing, and the guys have no idea what you're pointing at. <coughs> I mean, you only have one minute, right? I tend so to think curling coaches in general really haven't mastered the role in the timeout yet. I think, uh, you know, a lot of them come out, uh, I, I tend to like well, ones who come out and, and, and say, here's what I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. You can take it or leave it, you know, with the team. But I, I, yeah. I like a, I like an opinion, uh, with the understanding that the team's free to say, you know, you're you're full of whatever. Yeah, and it's funny because uh, with a lot of times with the Chinese players, and I have had the the experience with a lot of my junior teams, is they call you out just because they want to try a shot, but they know if they miss. They're going to get a lot of grief, but if you come out and you say, "Yeah, yeah, that's the shot to play," and then you miss, well, there's a lot of pressure taken off. So, I just realized I just also uh, said the complete opposite of what I said about Earl uh, with my last comment. But <laughs> I will say, when I think it's with developing curlers, uh, you got to let them. I, I actually think I had a junior coach who thought that coaches shouldn't be able to come out in timeouts in junior because he thought it's a better way to learn the game, and I, I guess I tend to agree with that. Yeah. So there you go. I'm, I'm on both sides right there. Hey, Dan, I usually give teams a chance to name their sponsors. So um, I guess yours is uh, China. <laughs> Actually, I was prepared for this question. Uh, we have one official and one unofficial sponsor, uh, unofficial being the Chinese government, I guess. And uh, the official sponsor, we had all the equipment we needed to perform at our best from uh, Asham Curling Supply. That is true. I did notice that. Yeah, everything from Asham. Hey, what's that logo that looks like two women sitting back to back? I see sometimes on your. On oh, your... that's uh, two years ago. Uh, they had uh, a clothing manufacturer, a sports clothing. It's uh, Kappa. Uh, oh, right. A P P A. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's, uh, it's an Italian clothing. I've seen it a few other places, but I, I really wasn't sure what yeah, it was. Yeah, the first time I saw it, actually, I thought it was those things you see on the mud flaps on the truckers. You know? Agreed, like, I did too. But it's uh, it's not two women, it's a little boy and a little girl, so, yeah. you know, I check. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dan, hey, thanks for your time. I know you're off on a vacation. Enjoy your time off, and yep. uh, we'll uh, see you on the ice next year, and maybe we'll have you back in the podcast. Thanks a lot, Dean, any time. That's the end of our interview with Dan Raphael. Before I go, a quick reminder to join the Curling Show group on Facebook and to consider making a small donation to this podcast at thecurlingshow.com. As always, thanks for listening, and despite the cold, wet weather here in the east, it's time for a little summertime pudding. <laughs>